Welcome back to the EQA from Mercedes EQ, the first fully electric compact member of the EQ family. This is the car that we are going to be living with for this video. It's an EQA 250 AMG line premium. So under the bonnet, that means there is one electric motor that can deliver 190 horsepower and 375 Newton meters of torque silently and instantly to the road below. Connected up to the motor is the car's 66.5 kilowatt hour capacity battery, which can give you a WLTP combined driving range of up to 263 miles. Zero to 60 is dealt with in 8.9 seconds, and the car has a limited top speed of 99 miles per hour, and it does feel really strong on the road. Now those are quite a few stats, but more about the car itself. I think it is a good looking machine especially in AMG line. I do like the way that the traditional, more dynamic AMG styling has been molded to a fully electric car to make it as efficient as possible. Everything that you see here is here for a reason, and the goal is increase aerodynamic efficiency, therefore increasing range. Oh, and most importantly, the car has two light bars. Light bar on the nose and another light bar on the rear, and I'm a massive fan of light bars. Inside, it is a lovely place to be. I do like the compact cabin from Mercedes-Benz. I really like the mixture of style design, but also space and ergonomics. There are some great toys to play around with. Standard equipment for the premium line includes keyless entry, panoramic sunroof, and loads, loads more. Now, of course, it's one thing to stand here and look at the car and talk about it, but it's another thing to drive it, and it's another thing to live with it. So that's what we'll do. Let's go and find out what the EQA is like to live with. I apologize if this is a little bit anticlimactic, but it drives like a Mercedes. It drives like an electric Mercedes. So if you've driven either one of those two things recently, then, well, it'll feel very familiar and you'll be up to speed in no time. It is an absolute doddle to take the car through town. The ride is well sorted. The wide track helps it get over speed bumps with no problem whatsoever and that instant motor response makes it not only a force to be reckoned with to get away from the lights, but it makes for such a smooth and easy way to get through stop-start traffic. So of course there are differences between how a electric car drives compared to a combustion car, or even a plug-in hybrid to a certain extent, and well, I think the most obvious difference is going to be in power delivery. Electricity travels almost at the speed of light, so when you put your foot down there is no let up and no delay whatsoever just instant response perhaps though where it does get more different is when you're slowing down so the great thing about electrified cars is they're able to use energy recovery and you'll notice i'm slowing down quite a lot and i'm not even touching the brakes for that there are a few different regeneration settings that you are able to program these are done on the steering wheel paddles you're able to go anywhere from D plus for minimum regeneration. The car will just glide along under its own momentum to D minus minus, which is maximum regeneration and very, very noticeable, let's say. Now the heavier regen settings, they are best used when driving around town, when you're in stop start traffic. I find when you're on a more flowing road that the lighter regenerative braking settings are better for, you know, well, driving smoothly, I guess. The one that I keep it in pretty much all the time is D Auto. This is where the magic happens. This is where the car will use a combination of the navigation data, radar, sensors to pick up what is going on around it. It will then take this information and work out just how much regenerative braking is needed to either maintain your current speed or maintain the distance to whatever it is in front. You get the impression from the EQA that there is a lot of stuff going on in the background and it just impresses me how it integrates all of that info that it picks up into a smooth driving experience. I did well over 100 miles going up and down motorways and dual carriageways for this video and it did feel quite well suited to high speed driving. The ride settles into its own at high speeds and you enjoy the same levels of refinement pretty much that you do when driving around town. It's an easy car to drive, it's an easy car to learn to drive and it's an easy car to get the most out of. It's really communicative 
and it does feel as if it wants to help you make your drive as comfortable and efficient as possible. Given that it's based on the GLA, a very practical compact SUV, the EQA does offer plenty of space to play with for loading and carrying items. In terms of accessing the boot, you can either push the three-pointed start away from you, use the button on the key, or if the car has keyless entry like this one does, then you can use hands-free access. Just a one-in, one-out kicking motion underneath the rear bumper will open up the boot, and then you can discover all the space you have to play with. It's quite deep, it's quite wide, it is quite tall as well, and there are nets in the outer edges of the boot for you to store your whole meal loaf, as well as all of the things that I tend to carry around whilst I'm filming. Now there is also some extra storage space just underneath the boot floor, so you can put, say, one of your charging cables there or some slightly smaller items. The boot floor itself is slightly higher than what it is in the GLA. This is to allow for room within the rear subframe for the second motor on the 4Matic models, but still there is plenty of room to play with. Moving away from the boot into the cabin, there are plenty of storage spots dotted all around. The central armrest is actually really deep, so a GoPro on a fully extended mount fits in no problem. This is one of my favourite solutions, having a pop-out cup holder in the armrest. I do love that. But most importantly, you can carry a championship winning GT1 car. Now, this is quite an interesting term, one that I could spend quite a while debating. But I would say in this context, quite sporty. A lot of the conversation about moving over to driving electric cars is to do with charging and the infrastructure. And over the last couple of years, the number of charging points in the UK has gone up from about 19,000 at the end of 2019 to over 43,000 as I'm filming this video in August of 2021. They are starting to appear in lots of places and there may be more options than you realise. We're going to start by taking a look at the AC public charging network. The charger that we are plugged into at the moment is called Cody Sven. I'm not making that up. And it's not actually that much taller than the bin, which is just behind the camera where I am at the moment. You've got to look out for them. They don't take up quite as much room as a traditional petrol station for court would. The other part of the public charging network you can take advantage of is the DC rapid charging side of it. Now DC rapid chargers deliver direct current to the battery which allows for much faster charging times as the energy is delivered at much higher rates. So the EQA is currently accepting electricity at a rate of 100 kilowatts and that means that a 10 to 80% charge can be completed in just half an hour. Now DC rapid chargers are appearing along the motorway network along major A roads and these are a great option for if you are doing a longer journey and want to get the battery topped up in a short space of time. As well as the public charging network, suitable properties can also have a wall box installed at home. So when you get home in the evening, you can plug the car in and by the time you need to go out the next morning, you have a full battery. And I have a feeling at the start of the move over to driving electric, everyone is going to be charging their car regardless of whether it's on 1% or 70%, just like we do with our phones. In terms of charging times, if I put the EQA on a 100 kilowatt DC rapid charger, then 10 to 80% will take just 30 minutes. Using an AC 11 kilowatt charger, the job is done from 10 to 100% in five hours and 45 minutes. And charging on a three pin plug at home will take about 30 hours. Much, much lower than running my car, that is for sure. The easy way to work out the cost of a charge is by multiplying the battery capacity by the unit cost of electricity that you are using. So let's use the average household energy unit cost as an example. That would be 66.5 for the EQA's battery multiplied by 16.5p or 0.165 pounds. And that would give you a 0 to 100% charge cost of 10 pounds and 97p. 
Now, a lot of energy providers are also rolling out EV optimized tariffs with much lower energy costs overnight. So if you are able to take advantage of one of these, someone in the office is on a energy tariff with about 5p per kilowatt hour overnight, you do the maths. The cost of charging these cars can be absolutely minuscule. To work out the car's cost per mile, you divide the charge cost by the range. So dividing £10.97 by 263 would give me a cost per mile of just 4.1p. That compares to 22 to 24 pence per mile for my own car and about £80 for a full tank of 99 octane unleaded. Naturally, the cost of charging will vary depending on where you go and who the provider is, but from my experience, even the more expensive charging options are still a lot cheaper than filling up my car with petrol. And if you are quite a high mileage user like I am, then you will notice a big, big reduction in your running costs. This is Sky. She's usually happiest when chasing butterflies, hunting for treats, or carrying sticks twice her own body weight, but... I think she's quite happy in here. You like the EQA, don't you, Sky? Job done. On to the next test. Now, this is one of the biggest questions about driving electric, but also in a wider context, I think it's important for not just personal transportation, but, well, transportation in general. How do we make it more sustainable? How do we make it kinder for the environment? And driving electric is a great place to start. For one, an electric motor is somewhere between 70 and 90% efficient, so it can use 70 to 90% of all of the energy that goes into it for useful things like driving the car. Not a lot of that energy is wasted. Compared to a combustion-powered car, they are somewhere between 30 to 50% efficient, so the difference is huge. Now, of course, electric cars, they are zero local emissions cars. There are no tailpipe emissions, as it has no tailpipe after all, but the energy that is in the battery has got to come from somewhere. Now, there's a big misconception that all of the energy comes from coal, but that just isn't the case. In the last year, only 1.6% of all of the electricity generated for the national grid in the UK came from coal. That's, that's tiny. It's a minuscule fraction of what it used to be. So we are making some great steps. Where else is the energy coming from? Well, at the moment, around 50%, 45 to 50% on a day-to-day -day basis comes from combined cycle gas turbines, and the other half is made up of renewable and low-carbon sources, things like nuclear, biomass, solar farms, and wind. So what does this mean for you as the driver? Well, it means that you can start to greatly reduce your carbon footprint whilst driving. Even plugging the EQA into the grid using today's energy mix, that would reduce my reliance on fossil fuels by 50%. And you can reduce your reliance on fossil fuels, well, completely, if you're smart with how you charge it, and go for renewable energy sources only. Now, running an electric car on wind for the entirety of its lifetime, according to a life cycle assessment done by one of our competitors, means that the break-even point between where an electric car starts to become better for the environment than a combustion-powered car is reached at 31,000 miles. Of course, the break-even point will vary depending on what sort of energy mix you use, but I think that's a great start. And that is also taking into account the fact that, generally speaking, an electric car has a bigger carbon footprint when it leaves the factory than a petrol or a diesel one. Now that life cycle assessment is well worth reading if you like your stats, like your figures, and like to see how these conclusions are reached. But Mercedes-Benz will be introducing fully carbon neutral production across all of its European factories in 2022. There are already factories in Europe, some engine factories, and the new Factory 56, where the EQS and the S-Class are built, which are already certified carbon neutral. Picking where you get your energy from is important as well. So if you go to places like GridServe and Ionity or just use a Mercedes Me charge card, you can guarantee that you are receiving 100% renewable energy. Now, yes, okay, that is a lot of numbers, a lot of stats, but what it says to me is that an electric car will be better for the environment than driving a combustion powered car. Put it this way, I make seven tons of carbon dioxide, that's excluding all of the other pollutants, but seven tons of CO2 from my own car each year. That is three and a half EQAs 
worth of carbon dioxide. It really does start to make you think that. There's a different art form to hustling an EV along a section of road like this. I mean, when I'm on this road, I usually have six cylinders making a lot of noise with me, but <laughs> I'm enjoying this. The future of performance with electric cars, I think, is going to be very, very interesting. Now, there is a slightly different art form to B-road driving in an electric car. So I need to load the car up and guide it into corners, not throw it in there. They're happiest when they're guided in, I'd say. Use the weight, use the low centre of gravity to your advantage to get the car set up nicely. It's got good traction, holding on round the corner and then fire as you come out. <laughs> My driving style is actually quite well suited to EVs because I do a lot of lifting and coasting and you'll see I've been fiddling around with the paddles quite a lot as so I've been going in and out of the corners getting the regen level right for getting me at the right speed before I need to turn in. So it will keep you focused, it will definitely definitely keep you engaged. Traction control does a good job of letting you have fun without being too interfering and well <laughs> I like it. Nowhere in the memo did it say that an EV needed to be boring to drive, and the EQA is <laughs> its actually quite playful, <laughs> really entertaining. So, to answer the question, can an EV be enjoyable to drive? Oh yes. Oh yes. I'm really impressed by this, actually. <laughs> The EQA comes to the UK as both a Sport and AMG line trim level, and although this is the entry point to the Mercedes EQ family, that doesn't mean that the standard equipment is entry level. I think it is a great standard equipment offering. There are some brilliant pieces of kit that come with every UK-bound EQA. Everyone has ambient lighting in the cabin, as well as the widescreen cockpit on the twin 10.25-inch displays. The car that we lived with for this video was AMG Line Premium, and you can pick between this model line or Premium Plus if you'd like some more features on the car. Prices for the EQA are on screen now. We've put a link to the brochure in the description, so make sure to check this out for more information. This is a car that I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with since it debuted in the UK in early 2021. I've driven it pretty much everywhere, save for through a lake, obviously, but not just for this video, doing a few hundred miles and caking it in road grime and moths and everything, but it's been to the centre of London, it's been up and down motorways, it's been through towns, villages, you name it, I've done it with the EQA. And it's also one that has kept me thinking ever since I first got out of it, and that is a rare thing for a car to do. It keeps on proving itself, it keeps on making a really strong case for itself, and I think that is a key attribute for it, because it's wading into a very, very competitive part of the market with some great products in the mix, but I think where this stands above the rest is the fact that it's a Mercedes. There is only one Mercedes in the market that it is wading into. I think about it in the same way that I think about the EQC. I don't feel constrained by the fact that it has a battery under the floor and an electric motor under the bonnet rather than a fuel tank and a combustion engine. When it comes to charging, you know, it's just like when you start to get low on fuel, you find somewhere to top up. In this, it's exactly the same. You just top up with electricity rather than liquid or gas. As for where we are with the public charging network, I think we've made some great improvements. There is still a bit of a way to go in some aspects, and I do hope that the continued rise of the EV starts to spell the end for the sign up before you charge up and some of the interesting methods of payment that some providers ask for. There's no need for all of the faff, to be honest. Just make it simple, make it clear billing, and give me a receipt, please. That is all I need. And anyway, if you are able to have a wall box installed at home, then I think living with an EV can be especially convenient. Get home, plug in, charge up. By the time you go out the next morning, you've got a full battery. And that's the best thing about EVs, or one of the best things about them, is when they're doing nothing, that time can be used to get them topped back up and ready for the next day.
We've spent a lot of time in this video out of town, but I do think it really does shine when you are in town. The lack of any gears to shift through and the instant power delivery makes for a seamless drive through the city and a very efficient one too. So where does that leave me? Well, like I've said, it's kept me thinking and it's the only Mercedes in this corner of the market and I think that gives it an edge. Could I live with an electric car? Yeah, I think I could, definitely. I think that pretty much all of my driving, actually no, in fact, all of my driving, provided I stop to charge every now and then, could be done using an electric car. And again, at no point did I wish that the car had a fuel tank and an engine under the bonnet. I don't think it needs it, to be honest. And would I live with an EQA? Yeah, I think so. For me personally, I would like about another 100 horsepower and some drive to the rear wheels. And interestingly, that's what the EQA 354MATIC offers. And that's something I'm really looking forward to trying. But yeah, I think the EQA is an incredibly capable all-rounder. It's an incredibly capable electric car. It's an incredibly capable Mercedes. What do you think? Let us know. If you'd like to find out more about the rest of the range, including the Mercedes EQ models, plug-in hybrids, AMGs, and the Smart family, then check out the rest of the videos on our channel. Make sure to subscribe to us too, so that you don't miss a thing. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really do hope that you have enjoyed it. There is still more to come from the EQA. We have a lot more planned for this model and for the rest of the Mercedes EQ range. That we'll be getting to know very soon. We'll see you in the next one.